Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the first episode of Warships Ascendancy of the Terrible, the series in which I examine various real life and fictional ships that were obsolete on launch, were evolutionary dead ends, or were never used to their full potential in the way that they were intended. Or were just plain awful. Inspiration for the series came from Rada's Legacy of the Worthless for Yu-Gi-Oh! archetypes, as well as Drakenfell's channel in general. Uh, and, you know, overall series inspired by Space Dock. So, yeah, there you go. Um, I'm going to try to do one of these videos roughly every five Warships episodes, just so, you know, they are coming out, but they're not all concentrated in one place. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoy this series. Um, I, I just felt that some of, these, some of the ships that that I have lined up are just so, so bad that they need their own series. But right now, we're going to deal with the topic at hand. So, the topic at hand in the first ship for this litany of failures and inadequacies is the MV Adi Gill, a fast, lightweight ship used by the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society during its 2010 Antarctic anti-whaling campaign, Typical disclaimers are in effect for videos about Sea Shepherd, everyone be civil in the comments, or face the ban hammer at your own risk. The Adi Gill, originally named Earthrace, was laid down in January 2005 and launched on February 22, 2006. It is a 13-ton trimaran measuring 78 feet long with a beam of 23 feet and a draft of 14 feet. It's propelled by two 540 horsepower Cummins engines, which gave it a top speed of 32 knots and a range of 12,000 nautical miles. It required a crew of four, but could carry up to eight people. The ship was designed by LOM Ocean Designs and built by Caliber Boats in New Zealand. The ship is a wave-piercing trimaran, which allows it to effectively cut through waves rather than travel on top of them. The ship can cut through waves of up to 49 feet and go up to 23 feet underwater. The ship's diesel engines could run off biodiesel to make it more environmentally friendly. The hull of the boat was a composite of carbon fiber and Kevlar coated in a non-toxic anti-fouling paint. The ship's intakes were on its two large fins, the two props under the main hull, while the rudders were on the pontoons. The ship was well suited for maneuvers over 12 knots, but under this speed the ship became rather sluggish. The total cost of the ship was around $2.5 million, mostly raised by fundraising. The ship was built to circumnavigate the globe, and it was meant to showcase environmentally friendly technology. The ship's first attempt started on March 10th, 2007, departing from Barbados. However, the ship had problems with its propellers, among other mechanical issues. One such issue off Palau caused an eight-day delay because of engine problems. On March 19th, the ship hit a local fishing boat off Guatemala. No one on Earth race was hurt, but one of the fishing crew was never found again. The ship was held in custody during an investigation in which they were absolved of responsibility. These delays made it so that their first attempt didn't actually break the record. The ship began again in San Diego on April 7th, but a crack in the hull was discovered on May 31st, which meant the ship needed a refit. Said refit took place at the Vulcan shipyard at the port of Segunto. Another attempt began on April 27, 2008. The ship was crewed by cameraman Rob Druitt, navigator Adam Carlson, engineer Mark Russell, and skipper Pete Bethune. Almost immediately, the ship began to experience autopilot problems. On April 30th, the lift pump became clogged. Nevertheless, the ship arrived in the Azores ahead of schedule, and most of the technical issues were fixed. The ship bypassed the line at the Panama Canal, and on day 22, about halfway to Hawaii, the crew noticed a severe vi vibration. Further investigation revealed a nylon net that had fouled the prop. Day 34 saw them shear two blades from the port propeller off Palau. They continued to Singapore on one engine where they would make repairs. The boat was hoisted from the water in a large sling where said repairs were made. On day 48, all the crew were suffering from heat and high humidity, and all had heat rash. They encountered a monsoon weather, forcing them to reduce their speed until they reached Amman. While in the Red Sea, the transponder was damaged, and the marine tracker stopped working. Another pump malfunction limited their speed again to 16 knots. On June 27, 2008, the ship set a new record for circumnavigating the globe with a powered boat with a time of 60 days, 23 hours, and 49 minutes. This beat another future Sea Shepherd ship, the Ocean 7 Adventure. It's disputed whether this is faster than the USS Triton's claimed time, and it also did not supersede the overall record set by the wind-powered Rupama 3. In 2009, Earthrace was acquired by the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society for Operation Waltzing Matilda, its 2009-2010 Antarctic anti-whaling campaign in the Southern Ocean. The ship was acquired because of its speed and ability to keep up with the whaling fleet. This is where we get into the actual uselessness of the ship. The ship was intended as a support ship, as well as an interceptor. However, going into the Southern Ocean is a dangerous thing, and something Earthrace, now named Adi Gill, was not built to do. 
As an example, the Sea Shepherd vessel Steve Irwin is a much larger ship, one made of steel, and one that doesn't have a reinforced hull for ice. And it has often almost had its hull punctured by ice in the Southern Ocean. The Adigil is a fiberglass, wood, and aluminum construction, not steel. I don't see anything wrong with that if you don't. On October 17, 2009, the ship was presented to the media as the Adigil for the first time, and hopes were high for its inclusion in the 2009-2010 campaign. The ship would sail alongside the Steve Irwin, captained by Paul Watson, serving as flagship, and the newly acquired icebreaker Bob Barker, captained by Chuck Swift. Pete Bethune again would command the Adi Gill, but this time with Sea Shepherd personnel on board. The idea was he was supposed to train the future captain of this ship. Four to eight layers of Kevlar were added to protect against ice, and the area below the waterline saw further laminations added. The ship had paint intended to scatter Japanese radar, not unlike the F-117. It was also fitted with broadband radar that was nearly undetectable. However, despite all this, and despite being designated as a stealth craft, the Adi Gil was not designed to deflect radar like the F-22, and so while the ship was hard to detect, it was not invisible. The ship saw other upgrades like FLIR cameras, Iridium satellites, and new speakers. Sea Shepherd stated that the ship was not going to be used as a confrontational vessel, which I'm sure no one believed because, hey, it's Sea Shepherd we're talking about here. Paul Watson stated later in 2009 that it was going to be used as a harpoon ship interceptor, getting between the harpooners and the whales. The campaign got off to an auspicious start with the Bob Barker having to sneak out of harbor in Africa after possibly being spotted by a Japanese ship, the Steve Irwin immediately picking up a tail in the form of the ICR security ship Shonen Maru No. 2, and the Adi Gill's radar blowing clean off, forcing it to return to Hobart before it crossed the 50th parallel. The Adi Gill would be repaired and returned to service, and would head back for the Southern Ocean, cleaning up the odd drift net and rendezvousing with the Steve Irwin before harassing one of the whalers. The ship would tow ropes in attempts to foul the propellers of Japanese ships, but this worked about as well as it usually did. Interestingly, the ship also had a shoulder-mounted potato gun for firing bottles of non-toxic butyric acid to taint the whale meat and make life in general unpleasant for the crews of the whalers. This means that for a brief time, the Adigil can be considered possibly the smallest and silliest armed merchant raider in history. However, unlike the Atlantis and Penguin, the Adigil's fun would end rather unceremoniously, but nonetheless climatically on January 6, 2010. The vessel was engaging the 8,000-ton factory whaling ship Nishin Maru when its fuel reserves were depleted entirely. The ship thus drifted back behind the massive factory vessel and back into the greater battle going on between the Bob Barker and the Shonen Maru No. 2. The Adi Gil was set to refuel with the Barker, however, the Shonen Maru No. 2 had other ideas. Angling in a turn, and in the spirit of the many Italian and Austrian ships at the Battle of Lissa, rammed the Adi Gil, breaking it clean in actual half. As a quick aside on this ramming, while I do believe the ram was intentional, I don't believe the intent of the Shonen Maru No. 2 was to break the ship in literal half. The Shonen Maru No. 2 in the footage clearly turns towards the Adi Gil, but had the seas been a flat calm, something which in the Southern Ocean requires nothing less than selling one's soul to Poseidon, the Shonen Maru No. 2 would have clipped the bow and taken the ship out of action, but likely would have left the ship intact and able to be repaired and sent back to Tasmania. However, the Shonen Maru No. 2 bounced off two waves, which put the ship in a harder starboard turn than its rudder was likely set to, meaning that instead of clipping the bow, the old harpooner ran the Adi Gil directly amidships, shearing the front off the vessel and nearly killing one of the crew who was inside. Fortunately, everyone escaped, and apart from one of the crew, a New Zealand cameraman who sustained six broken ribs, everyone else escaped with little more than a mild soaking courtesy of the Shonen Maru No. 2's water cannons. The Sea Shepherd crews were understandably very angry, and as such refused the Shonen Maru No. 2's offer for assistance, and instead picked up the crew themselves, taking the stricken ship under tow. It was towed towards the Diamant Duville station, a French installation in Antarctica. The weather conditions were favorable for a salvage operation, but the ship reportedly took on too much water, and since none of the Sea Shepherd vessels were equipped for, nor were designed for, nor were really capable of any kind of meaningful salvage, the ship was cut loose and later left to sink. Bethune later claimed that Watson told him to scuttle the ship for PR purposes. While Sea Shepherd and Pete Bethune's accounts are very different as to the actual sinking of the vessel, with the former claiming that it was inevitable and the later claiming that it was done for publicity, my own analysis is that had Sea Shepherd had a larger ship capable of bringing the Adi Gill aboard, it may well have been salvageable, but neither the Steve Irwin nor the Bob Barker were capable of such an operation. Towing the ship back to port would have left only one Sea Shepherd vessel in the area for several weeks, and it's likely that the ship would have foundered in the first patch of rough seas they came across, 
so cutting the ship loose and scuttling it may have been the best course of action for everyone involved. However, because of the lightweight construction of the ship, it actually may have remained afloat just below the surface, acting as yet another piece of debris for ships to have fun navigating around. Both sides blamed each other. Pete Bethune seems to be the most reasonable of them all, relatively speaking, stating that he believed that the captain of the Shonen Maru No. 2 miscalculated his intended ram to clip the bow of the ship. Swift claimed that the whalers were stationary when the Adigil stopped, then powered up and intentionally cleaved it in half, a claim that Watson backed up. However, when legalities between Watson, Adigil, and Bethune began to go south, he changed his story, as he so often does, stating that Bethune stopped in front of the Shonen Maru No. 2 negligently. Sea Shepherd's claims are about as reliable as a used car salesman's claim that the Ford Pinto has no serious design flaws. However, the whaling fleet's claim is equally as baffling. The Institute of Cetacean Research claims that the ship was rammed while trying to foul the prop of the Shonen Maru No. 2. While the Adigil was involved in prop fouling attempts and crossed the bow of whaling ships multiple times, on this particular day she was crossing the bow of the Nishin Maru, not the Shonen Maru No. 2. The whalers claim that the water cannons on board their ships forced the conservationists to maneuver erratically, including reducing of speeds, which would later cause the ramming. This is why I don't believe either side, because neither of them seem to be anywhere near accurate to what the footage shows. The Australian Maritime Safety Authority was inconclusive in its investigation, but did verify claims made by Sea Shepherd. The Japanese government declined to participate in said investigation. New Zealand authorities found both parties at fault, and New Zealand came out of this looking like absolute geniuses, in my humble opinion. The ICR found the wreck and showed it leaking diesel fuel, which it then claimed was Sea Shepherd's fault for polluting the Southern Ocean, and reminding everyone why no one takes either side seriously. It also found a good bit of debris that they claim belonged to the ship, and in all likelihood did, including large arrows, which the whalers stated were weapons meant to be used against their crew, which Sea Shepherd denied, stating they were meant to poison the flesh of dead whales. The arrows were used as an excuse to expel Bethune from Sea Shepherd. And so the perpetual game of he said, she said continued between the ICR and the SSCS, with everyone suing everyone else involved and frankly making utter fools of themselves, as is usually the case in these scenarios. I could go into all the legalities, but frankly I like having sanity, and so I will refrain from doing so. So with that taken care of, why exactly was this ship useless? The Adi Gil was a case of the right ship for the wrong purpose. Earth Race was built to do one thing, a thing it did quite brilliantly, however it was not designed for any kind of naval engagement the likes of which it faced in the Southern Ocean. Frankly, the Adi Gil was the exact wrong ship to be used in such a campaign, and fortunately, Sea Shepherd learned its lesson. Uh, of course not. In fact, in my opinion, it was quite lucky that the Shonen Maru No. 2 hit it, as at least there were a good number of people and ships around when the crew needed rescuing, because if the Shonen Maru hadn't done it, an iceberg probably would have. If it had been me, I would have spent the money donated to buy the Adi Gill in reinforcing the hull of the Steve Irwin and further renovating the Bob Barker, as it did suffer some fairly major engine trouble before even reaching the Southern Ocean. If I couldn't get away from buying Earth Race, I would not have sent it into the Southern Ocean, rather using it on other campaigns or as a publicity tool. My opinion on this ship is split. On one hand, I think it's an excellent design. On the other hand, I think it's the greatest waste of money that Sea Shepherd, or in fact any organization, could have made for a ship for this purpose. Was the ship poorly designed? No. But it was poorly utilized, and its poor utilization led to its loss. And that is why it is the first episode in this new series. Subseries. Whatever. I hope you enjoyed this series. Subseries. What? Whatever. I don't. I don't. I haven't. It's not. I haven't decided if it's a separate series or not. But it's still going to be under the warship's name. So, I think subseries is the proper term. Anyway, I'm going to try to do them every five episodes or so, like I said earlier. Uh, I'm still going through old videos at the time of recording this, so it will likely be one of the only videos on the channel at the time of upload. And some of my Warships videos that are on the list are being redone for various reasons. But I figured I should continue to make new content, so here you go. That's also why it's, this one's listed as episode 5, when I think there's only, like, one with an episode number, and two or three that don't have episode numbers, but I'm counting as episodes. So, yeah, it's a lovely time. Hope you enjoyed, and if you did, like, subscribe, and all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!